Greetings, listeners, and welcome back to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. Of all the magnificent intellectual and cultural achievements of medieval Judaism, the flowering of Hebrew poetry is surely among the greatest. Jewish life within the sphere of the Islamic empires between the 10th and 12th centuries gave rise to some of the finest Hebraic lyricists and wordsmiths ever to grace the pages of Jewish history. These poets expressed the hopes, the dreams, the sorrows, and the triumphs not only of their own lives, but also of the Jewish nation as a whole. Even today, many Jews continue to use these poems as songs of praise on Sabbath and festivals, as songs of divine glory in the synagogue, or as laments during times of sorrow. No one who reads these poems could fail to be moved by their power or fail to be impressed by their immense creativity. With us to explore this golden age of Hebrew poetry is a quite extraordinary gentleman, Mr. Peter Cole. He is one of the foremost Jewish poets of our time, whose books and collections of poetry have won wide acclaim and a variety of awards, and he was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2007. He is also a widely acclaimed translator of poetry, having published numerous works that render medieval Hebrew poetry into a sublime modern English. While a resident of Jerusalem, He's also a senior lecturer in Judaic Studies and Comparative Literature at Yale University, where he spends a semester every year. It is truly an honor to have him with us today on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. Professor Cole, thank you for joining us. Thank you, JJ, and it's great to be part of your enterprise. Excellent. Well, thank you, thank you. So let's uh, let's dive a little bit in uh, to the world of medieval poetry, and let's start with a bit of the historical background. So roughly speaking, uh, the Jews of the Islamic uh, sphere, especially of medieval Spain, between the 10th and the 12th century, uh, are generally con- generally considered to have produced this golden age uh, of Hebraic poetry. So let us begin by asking, why is this? What were the conditions that allowed for this flowering of medieval Hebrew poetry? So, uh, you know, that, that's the big question and one to which there is essentially no answer. Um, but let me, let me start with kind of principles, which is, or, or take it from a, consider it from a more broadly humanistic perspective. Um, We often say, and here we're dealing with poetry, right? So we're dealing with subjectivities at some essential level. People often say there's no accounting for taste. And as I understand it, what you're asking here is, where did the taste, where did the sensibility, the taste for a certain kind of literary, emotional, uh, religious, verbal experience that sort of pervaded this 10th through 12th century Andalusian primarily culture, but not only Andalusian, where did that come from? And so we say there's no accounting for taste. We use that phrase all the time in speech, right? Especially when we disagree with somebody or we don't understand what they like. There's no accounting for taste. But actually there is accounting for taste. There's a, there's a kind of etiology of taste. If we find out what did this person read? Where did this person grow up? Who were this person's teachers? What did this person, what movies did they see? All these kinds of things can help you account for taste. And we can do the same with the Andalusian Jewry uh, of the Middle Ages. That said, a historian like S.D. Goitain, Shlomo Dov Goitain, who knew as much about medieval Jewish history in the middle of the 20th century, he, I mean, he was in the middle of the 20th century, and the, up to the last, uh, the 1980, died 1980, 81, something like that, who knew as much about this medieval history as anybody alive when it came to what happened on the sort of the literary front in Andalusia, he just talked about it as the Spanish miracle. In other words, that's something that we cannot account for, that we cannot explain, at least literarily, figuratively, it seemed like that to him. So if it seemed like that to him, we should, you know, be careful about trying to explain such wonders away. Um, That said, we look back to sort of the ideology of uh, where all this sensibility, where this sensibility came from, because it really was very distinct, very unusual in the history of Jewish literature, Jewish thought, Jewish feeling, Jewish perception, right? Jewish physical observation. It contains a kind of curious combination of tensions or a curious combination of combinations. Um, It's born in a kind of cultural openness that 
also tur- is uniquely turned inward. It's got a concern with the sort of the center, the, the Jewish nation, as you put it, and, and the periphery. Um, it's when I say it's one, and, and also with a, with a, with a focus on, when I say it's born in a kind of strength, it's, it's born of a strength that allows for a cultural openness that helps a culture, helps one and one group of people determine its own weaknesses and address them. And when, so when I say that generally, I'm thinking of Sa'ad Gaon in Baghdad in the 10th century, living in a culturally or ideologically, yeah, let's say culturally quite insular uh, Jewish community. But he intellectually is porous, is completely open to the surrounding Islamic culture around him, which is far more advanced than Jewish culture is at the time. Intellectually, it's, it's one of the great civilizations of the world. Baghdad is one of the great cities of the world on pretty much every level, scientific, uh, philosophical, artistic, certainly literary. And he realizes that this is a kind of uh, weakness within the Jewish community, this lack of, this kind of fear of, of intellectual inquiry. And which brings with it metaphysical inquiry and, and religious inquiry. Um, and so that turning outward is what really gives rise to that, the, the seed that produced this poetry. And that comes through a student of Sa'adia's named Dunash Ben Labrat, most known in, let's say, traditional Jewish circles these days for a few of the religious poems he wrote, Dror Yikra and things like that. And um, it's, it's Dunash who gets the idea to, Sadia wrote some poetry, but it was not necessarily as inf- influenced by the Arabic poetry around him. Everything else that Sadia did was very much influenced by Arabic. Arabic also was his mother tongue. This is really critical to, imagine, to remember that um, the Jews we're talking about spoke Arabic as their mother tongue. What English is to us, Arabic was to them. And um, so while Sadja wrote poems and while he wrote a Hebrew dictionary, a rhyming dictionary, which suggested that poetry was also very important to him, it was Sadja who said, we can extend this desire to incorporate the wholeness of Islamic, of Arabic learning into our culture by also copying and absorbing their poetry. And he took that sort of, that leap into it appeared to get some kind of approval from Saadia, though it's uh, the, as it's passed down in the historical record, it's a little ambiguous. And he goes off to Spain, uh, Morocco initially, and then to Spain. And that's where the poetry takes root. And there in Spain, in Cordoba, you have a completely different situation, or the inverse situation. You have uh, a court. A, a Jewish court under a under Muslim, uh, in the context of a, a Muslim uh, society, um, the chief courtier there is uh, Hastai Ibn Shaprut, who's a major figure. We can talk about him later, uh, and he has a court poet. But the Jewish community there is ideologically quite conservative. They're not that interested in turning outward intellectually in the way that Sadia was and his disciple. Um, that Dunash was, but socially, culturally, they're very assimilationist. Hastai Ibn Shaprut was a vizier in the caliph's court in Cordoba. Uh, Jews held major positions and minor positions. They were very much integrated into the Islamic uh, majority society. Uh, and that's in that strange meeting of opposites, that's where the poetry took root and flower. Fascinating. Um, and you would say, presumably, that at least a significant portion of it was based upon the general Islamic and Arabic, also similar appreciation for poetry and for wordsmithery and for um, adorning, let's say, the cultural life of the community with, uh, with this kind of literary output. Absolutely. I mean, this poetry can't properly be uh, considered intellectually. I think emotionally you can consider it at face value. But intellectually, and to get sort of a full, you, certainly if you want to understand where it came from, it's a, it's a kind of bizarre, perfect grafting 
of Arabic poetry and the tradition of Hebrew poetry. Um, it's written in essentially a adapted he, a b- biblical Hebrew, stripping out a lot of the rabbinic registers of Hebrew that have, had developed in between. Um, and onto that biblical Hebrew base is grafted all of the Arabic meters, the meters from Arabic poetry, the Arabic rhyme schemes, the sense of what a poem should sound like, what a poem should feel like. That comes from Arabic, right? The, these poets had a thousand years, two thousand years, or certainly a thousand years of poetry written in Hebrew that they could have modeled themselves on, what we call piyut, you know, liturgical poetry as it had developed. And they choose not to do that. They do something very different. So yes, the Arabic part uh, of this is absolutely central. Fantastic. And this this neatly segues into something else that I wanted to ask, which is, well, what were the major characteristics of a medieval Hebrew poet? Because you, uh, you, you made the distinction here, I think it's an important one, between this and Piyut, which had very distinct and, um, um, characteristics or, or qualities of its own. Um, whereas, you know, what makes a medieval, what makes a poem from this medieval period stand out? What would be its, its characteristics, qualities, both in terms of its its form, but also in terms of its content, what sorts of things were they writing about? In what sort of ways did they express themselves? Yeah, let me back up a little bit and make it a little more concrete with a, just two lines by Dunash, which are basically a fragment of a longer poem that we don't have the whole of. Um, and he wrote, uh, as I translate it, "Let Scripture be your Eden, and the Arabs' books your paradise grove." Right. So already the very beginning, right? That's the that's the the trunk basically of this poetry. He has this vision of, of grafting these two things. The, when it came, and he himself was an interesting poet, not necessarily a mature poet and or evolved poet. Um, but when the poetry did come to fruition and maturity, the characteristics of it we might say are uh, it's distinguished by its range, by its at least as I understand it. And a lot of these things are depending on. You know, this poetry is in the eye of the beholder at some level. There's, there's, no, there's no science. That the, re, the reading of this poetry itself is an art, uh, although the scholarship obviously is, is critical. Anyway, as I understand it, um, the dominant characteristics are its range, its suppleness, its vigor, its wisdom, and its surprise. The surprise, I think, is a really key thing. There is a, first of all, that's a, an element of all good poetry. Um, and I think this is a world-class poetry. But this, this poetry surprised its own culture. It surprised its own audience with, with a kind of force that I think is, it takes a while. It's, it's shocking. It's rather shocking, actually. To this day, it's even more shocking because we're, we're a little behind them in certain ways. <laughs> that, that's fascinating. Can you elaborate on that? In other words, they were more advanced or more um, daring or brave than us in, 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 or, or let's say than modern sensibilities in certain ways? Well, yeah. Um, let's start with the parochial Jewish aspect, and okay. I'll give you a little a little story that uh, I probably like to trot out a little too often, but it's too good not to tell. Um, which is when my book, The Dream of the Poem, came out. One of the first places I was invited this is an anthology of the, of the period's entire poetry from approximately nine fifty to fourteen ninety two. So also after it goes into the Christian wow. period, we could talk about that. Um, I was invited to a Syrian shul in Brooklyn, and I was a little nervous. What am I, what am I an Ashkenazi Jew from New Jersey? What do I have to tell these Syrian Jews about this? You know? And my host said, don't worry. They, do, they don't know anything about this, this poetry. They know a lot of other things, but this they don't know. It will be new to them. You just do whatever you want to do. And so I read the poems I wanted to read, and... Some of them, you know, the whole range of ex- human experience that these poets write about and including erotic poems and really sensual erotic poems and some homoerotic poems, which always gets people's attention, especially in the Jewish context. Um, and, you know, it went pretty well. And uh, afterwards, there was a group of young women, w- women who came up to me and they were sort of keep standing there sort of, uh, let's say, a modest distance from me. And... Um, you know, Mr. Cole, we would have to ask you, we'd like to ask you a question. Do you mind? No, you ask me anything you want. And he said, well, we were talking amongst ourselves and they looked at kind of, they were uncomfortable asking this question. I said, yes. And well, we were just having a hard time understanding. Said, yes. 
Um, what did the rabbis say about this poetry? And I said, like the penny dropped. And I said, ah, this is going to be a little hard for you to, to absorb, I suspect, but the rabbis wrote it. <laughs> and, and they like leapt back in fear. And one of them said, not our rabbis. <laughs> you know, there was... I was going to say, they're probably correct. Their rabbis could not have written something like this. Yeah. Although there are, I know, I mean, plenty of Sephardic, not plenty. I know some Sephardic rabbis who deeply appreciate this poetry and understand just how valuable and that humanistic level it is. Um, but so that, you know, there's, there's that sort of shock element of surprise. But let's say, you know, when I teach this kind of thing at Yale and I get all kinds of students, not Jewish, every color, stripe, ethnicity, religious background, I teach it at this point as a kind of piece of world literature. And if you can bring the students into the world, that medieval world, and it's different poetics, they understand the incredible level of refinement and sophistication and yoked with feeling and complicated national, let's say, identity dynamics. And all of that's going on in ways that just shocks them. This is what they have these ideas about, you know, Jewish life or medieval life. And this poetry just totally flies in the face of it. We're a little more sclerotic Jewishly than I think that society was. Yes, I agree. I, so there's one actually very interesting aspect of medieval poetry. Um, and the technical, uh, technical term for it generally is shibbutz. Um, and shibbutz again, correct me if I'm wrong, is something along the lines of, uh, it comes from a word that, like, inlaying or embroidering or, or something that's a place in the sort of a mosaic style, which is that these poems are generally sewn together largely from phrases or, uh, or terms that come up in the Bible. In other words, the Hebrew Bible is seen as the great um, repository of, of terms, of expressions, of, of motifs, and etc. Uh, and as you said, not so much rabbinic literature. Uh, but that, of course, brings up um, th that that brings up a very interesting dynamic because here you are sitting down and the lexicon from which the poet composes his poetry um, is a very specific and very defined lexicon. Um, and I wanted to ask, I mean, what was that like in the sense that they already had this huge hulking shadow, this kind of massive influence of the Hebrew Bible and were they trying to, um, you know, to play with it, to undermine it? Were they trying to to use it in ways that it wasn't used originally? What were the parameters, let's say, of creativity uh, or, or of you know, ability to reframe and reformulate that these poets had, uh, displayed regarding the Hebrew Bible, which they venerated? Right. So that goes back a little bit to what comes right out of what we're talking about with surprise at some level. Um, I mean, the basic answer is I have no idea what they were <laughs> thinking, right? This okay, is, yes. I, that is, it's an unfair question. Yeah. I have to, uh, I have to imagine, give a kind of informed projection back. Um, but that's what scholarship and translation and, and teaching and, and reading is. That's what reading is. Um, and this, this is, a, this is a, both a big issue and a non-issue at once, this question of where the Bible, where biblical quotation is in this. So let's start with the term as you did. The term shibutz, the modern Hebrew tashbetz, or that kind of implantation or embroidery or setting of a jewel in, in, in metal, right, um, is a modern scholarly term. The, the actual literary, and maybe a misleading one, um, although we can redeem it, but the, the literary phenomenon that it appears to be modeled on or taken from <clears throat> is Arabic. I mean, the whole notion of going back to the Bible, which seems like the ultimate nationalistic or chauvinistic or particularist gesture, and this is part of the surprise and yoking of tensions I'm talking about, itself can be seen as being borrowed from Arabic. From Islam, why? Because what is this? What what is considered the purest and most powerful? The Ur Arabic, the Quran. You go back to the sort of the Big Bang of the language, 
Hebrew is older than Arab, or at least the Bible's older than the Quran. So in that kind of cultural rivalry, which involves emulation as well, and primarily emulation at some level, going back to Hebrew is a very complicated form of emulation of Arabic. And in, and you can't take one step in this poetry without <laughs> it being interesting in just that way. Um, and the Arabic literary uh, phenomena that Shibuts models itself on is known, in, is known as iktibas, which is citing from the Quran or, or quotation generally. And the root, the three-letter root, just like well, the Sem Semitic languages, Arabic has three-letter roots by and large, um, that iktibas comes from is a, a burning coal, a lighting of one torch from another. In other words, a transfer, a, a dynamic transfer of energy, a movement of energy from one place and source to another, which is very different from shibuts, which is a freezing, right? And creating a static thing that's maybe beautiful and maybe fascinating and refracts light and does all kinds of interesting things. But the basic principles behind it are actually quite different. So the way I read this, just to cut it, you know, keep this uh, sort of digestible is, a weak poet in the medieval context, and the medievals themselves use these notions of strong poet, weak poet, sometimes quite brutally. Um, a weak poet, yes, would be crushed under the what Harold Bloom called the burden of the past, the shadow of, of the great rock of the, the Bible. The anxiety right? of influence, one might even say. Yeah. Um, and it would just be absolutely, you would create a kind of pastiche and a, an inert, essentially academic kind of poetry in the, in, in the worst sense. The strong poet says, <clears throat> this is interesting. And from a place of strength, of knowledge, of intimacy with all this stuff, of daring, of an understanding that the culture needs, needs renewal, as Saadja said, at its basis, they go in with a freedom that is shocking and take those pieces of the Bible. Shibuts usually has three words, at least in a row, that appear in the Bible. It's like, I mean, all the words come from the Bible at some level, re, uh, inflected. But, um, and they do whatever they want with it. And they sometimes make the biblical verses mean exactly the opposite of what it says in the Bible. Sometimes philosophically, sometimes semantically, sometimes halakhically the opposite. I mean, the freedom is, that's another part of the astonishing thing is just how free they can be with all that. Um, and that really comes from a, a place of, as I say, complete trust that they're not destroying. When, when Dunash came back to Spain, or came to Spain, he was met by that culturally conservative group around the court poet under Hastai, and there was a, it was like the culture wars flared up. What this experiment that he's, do, that he's undertaking of, sort of Arabizing Hebrew poetry, and poetry then was at the center of the culture, right? For Arabs, poetry, the, there's an expression the 14th century historian Ibn Khaldun said, uh, poetry is the diwan, is the archive of the Arabs. You want to know, that's where, that's the center of the culture. That's the, the TV show of today, you know. Um, and the opposition to Dunash was intense, saying this is a desecration and this is, will bring calamity on the Jewish people. Right? That's how, how central poetry was. Um, so here you've got, um, you've got poets who are going in and trusting that, no, this is not a desecration. This is not going to bring calamity. This is actually a kind of revival. This is a kind of Jewish renaissance, a redemption, a rescuing of all this material. My image, and maybe it's a little cheap, but it works, um, to help think about this Shibut stuff and all that we're talking about is, you know, if you imagine the Bible as a vast stained glass window, we'll take a churchly uh, image. And somebody goes in with, a, with or many people go in with sledgehammers, and they just 
shatter it, totally shatter it into little pieces. And sometimes the pieces contain three words. And sometimes they contain one word. And sometimes they contain 10 words. And, and they're going in and they're going to play a little refrigerator poetry <laughs> with this. And you can do anything, but it's all from the Bible, right? In other words, the, the scripture, the revealed text, has a lot more to reveal than just what it says in the Bible. And all of that is, is not just fair cultural gain, but sort of essential cultural gain. I wonder if one could make the argument that such creativity on the part of the poets um, followed on from rabbinic sensibility, especially midrashic sensibility. That really is um, at the heart of the midrashic enterprise is to take a few words, wrench it from context, and build, you know, towers or palaces of meaning based on these few words and extend it in whichever direction the, the darshan wishes to extend it. That's a great question, a great observation. Um, I think it's essentially true, not, not so much in a cause and effect right. sense, but, you know, as I said to those women at the Syrian shul, the rabbis wrote these poems. I, I, don't, I never call them rabbis, by the way, because that gives the wrong connotation. We just were into that associative field that's destructive. Um, but they were certainly, uh, uh, they were certainly as knowledgeable. They were the intellectual leaders within traditional Jewish fields as well. So they knew all that stuff. That's ingrained in them. And it's the same structure, the same principle we're talking about, which is, the history of of Jewish communities around the world is a lot more diverse and free, and the, the, the amount of sort of dissension in we make jokes about it, but it's it's real. We make there are stereotypes about it because there's a real phenomenon. So yeah, that kind of freedom within the discourse is is real, and and this is probably the this is the one place where I mean the basic difference, let's say is that the rabbis are doing this all within an explicitly religious, essentially halakhic framework, right? And these poets are, they also wrote, they wrote a whole body of liturgical poetry for the synagogue, we can talk about that, but at least half of their poetry was not for the synagogue. In other words, it was open for, it was for the, all that other time they had on their hands. And, um, and that's different from Midrash. That, is, that really is a kind of threat because there's no boundaries. Right. Now that I think about this, you bring this up, but while a lot of the poets that we will talk about and are very famous, uh, Shmuel Hanagid or Yudha um, Levi and others, many of them are highly respected in the rabbinic world, but very few of them produced great uh, rabbinic works. You know, these weren't Maimonides, Nachmanides, the, the great, the major rabbinic figures of the medieval period belong actually to a slightly different category. They're not, I'm struggling to think of, of a figure who, who bridges both. It's very interesting. Um, well, it also has to do with a particular time, right? Nachmanides is Spanish, but later in Christian Spain. Maimonides is Spanish, but later, or Iberian, but also a little bit later, cultural circumstances had changed. Um, so that's, I think, be behind some of it. There's more general questions which I want to discuss. Maybe uh, we will ask at the end. Uh, but for right now, I want to dive into perhaps one or two of the major uh, poets themselves, the major figures um, of this golden age of poetry. And the first I want to touch on is um, known sometimes as Samuel Ibn Nagrela, but often as Shmuel Hanagid, uh, who lived between the years 993 approximately and 1056. Um, Shmuel Hanagid, it's possible to say had the most extraordinary resume of any Jewish figure, arguably of the last couple of millennia, actually. There are very, very few figures who would have had quite a, a, a CV as his. Can you perhaps tell us a little bit about his life and him as a figure and also as a poet? You mean, is, uh, is, uh, is it a fake? <laughs> is it a real CV? <laughs> yes, yes. One looks at it and thinks, gosh, how did he manage all that in one life? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I remember uh, a very prominent biblical scholar uh, asked me once when I was working on Hanagi, um, because there's a, he's also credited with having written uh, an introduction to the Talmud, 
because there's a Shmuel Hanagid who wrote Mavolot Talmud. And um, I, I said to the guy, I said, you know, it's not, I don't, I don't, I'm relying just on what I read here, but it seems no. It seems that that's a, an Egyptian uh, Jewish figure, and it was a Shmuel Hanagid, and there was a, the, the office of the, the Nagid, sort of a kind of governorship of Jewry in, in Egypt at the time. And I said, so no, that was not him. He said, thank God, something he didn't do. <laughs> because, because it really, you know, he was so, and it, he, there's a legend about him sort of rising from uh, refugee poverty up to, to greatness, which also may be taken from Arabic, an Arabic poet, right? So there's that. But, but we do have historical, some historical record of him, both in Hebrew and in Arabic, which is to say Arabic by, written by Andalusian um, Muslims, um, confirming that he was the governor, leader of, of Iberian Jewry, the Nagid. He was also, thanks to his sort of gifts as a writer of Arabic prose, brought into one of the local courts in southern um, Spain in Malaga, and eventually brought to the major court of the period in Granada, where he was appointed vizier, minister, under a Muslim Berber king. And eventually, because of his interpersonal gifts, his general wisdom, his people skills, let's put it that way, his, his skills as a writer, uh, as a leader, as a, as a thinker, he was appointed chief vizier, or we can call it prime minister, of the Muslim state of Granada. So that's, you know, that, that's enough to get people's attention. You have a Jew in the 11th century who is leading a Muslim state as its chief political officer under a Muslim king. And if that wasn't enough, he was also the head of its army, Muslim army which he leads into leads successfully into battle for many years against rival city states um taifa is the arabic word for it for party states is the way it's called in literature um seville and other states um on on the west coast on the east coast um and there's a kind of constant war local warfare and he's the leader and he writes all about all of that in Hebrew. Um, he also did author a work uh, on halakha. We have only fragments of it, but he was certainly well-versed in all that. And we can see from his poetry that it's saturated with, even though it's written in a biblical Hebrew adapted for the Arabic meters and, and inflections, and um, it's saturated with all of the midrashic material you were talking about. So just to sum up, he was um, the leader of the Jewish community and a senior Talmudist and, and, and halachist, uh, and also the prime minister of the state in which he was in, and also the leading general of the army, and finally, the greatest Jewish poet uh, of his generation and arguably of any. Yeah, we're not sure he was a leading Talmudist, right? That may have oh, been I the see. Egyptian, okay, right? But, but all the other things uh, are, are, appear to be true. And yeah, I talk about him, I think about him as. Um, you know, he was sort of like, imagine Henry Kissinger, you know, or like writing poetry that knocked your socks off and something like right. that. Um, yes, it, it's quite a, quite a resume. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about his poetry. And one of the things that is struck, and, and you, you know, translated many of his poems uh, uh, in a book, and um, what strikes one, um, among many other things, is the sheer range of the poetry. He talks about everything. He, re he reflects on love and friendship, and death, and war, and God, and morality, and wisdom, uh, and pleasure, and evil, and pain, and it's, it's just, it's all there. Um, and, and I mean, I would just like to know, you know, was this par for the course? Uh, was he, uh, you know, was he extraordinary in that regard as well? Um, and also, was all of this, were all of these aspects of his poetry um, brought out in a similarly powerful manner? In other words, was he really of one kind, but dabbled in many other uh, um, e sort of areas of the emotional range, let's say, of a human being? Or did he really excel and, and bring to bear all of this in, in, a, in a virtuosic manner? 
Yeah, par for the course is uh, also a complicated thing to think of. Like, if that's par for the course, I don't know about the well, the notion of par becomes, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, but it touches on something central about the poetry, which is, um, is the poetry emblematic of, back to taste and sensibility, of a sensibility that characterized the entire, let's not say the entire culture, but certainly the the learned culture, the educated culture, the, you know, you can say elite, but that's what we got for those days. Um, and, and the answer for that is yes. Was his range greater than any other poet, major poet of that period? The answer is also yes. I mean, it's really, he's an extraordinary, extraordinary figure. Um, uh, to this day, I don't quite, when I was when I started reading him seriously, I was convinced I was misreading because how could it be? How could it be that I didn't? You know, where's this guy been all my life? Um, how come people don't know about him? Um, and uh, one of the reasons they don't know might not know about him is because it, it's hard for people. Just like again, back to the Syrian shul, it's hard for people to accept that this poetry exists. Uh, as itself and isn't some kind of allegorical something or other. And it was just try, they try to explain it away in all sorts of ways. But yes, there was such a person. And I think he was, we have enough evidence. Um, you know, even going back to Sa'aj's book of beliefs and opinions, which is an ex- the, the range of human experience in that philosophical book is also extraordinary, written in Arabic, right? Um, so. Yeah, I think he he was emblematic, um, but his his mastery of the material and his range uh, as a poet, but also within life, he could not fake it as a leader of the army. Like that's that either like the proof is in the pudding there, and you come home alive or dead, or you don't come home at all. And he lived for you know, a pretty long time, uh, and and Granada was a very powerful um, city state in that. Andalusian kind. So I, I definitely want to ask about that. But before I do, I would say that another reason uh, people may have not known or heard of Shmuel and I get is that they make the mistake of not buying your books, which is of course a, a capital error. Well, I'm talking about before, thank you, but <laughs> I'm talking about before. Uh, and one of the reasons they didn't know about it because the poetry was lost. Yes. It was recovered when? Late 19th century? Am I mistaken? Early 20th? Something like that. There were parts of it were recovered late 19th century, but the big find was in the first third of the, uh, the 20th century. Uh, Bialik was involved in, in it, uh, and um, um, and of course, then when when things are lost historically, sometimes it's chance, but chance is also determined by a numbers game, and there was no demand. You know, there was demand for that poetry fell out, fell off drastically at a certain point because the social circumstances changed. Whereas poetry, were, he didn't write for the synagogue; he wrote religious poetry, what we think of as religious poetry. But he did not write for the synagogue per se, and um, so the, when the c- cultural Jewish situation changed, when the Iberian experiment, let's call it Andalusian experiment, fell apart, um, the demand for his poetry decreased, and it's copied less. Manuscripts don't circulate, and so it was only recovered in the nineteenth. The, the big diwan, the big collection, was uh, recovered in the twentieth uh, century. Um, I, so I wanted to go back to what you were saying before about um, Shmuel Hanagid's martial uh, life and, and, and as a victorious general and a leading general uh, in an Islamic army, uh, because this biographical element of his is, is quite unique in Jewish history um, and certainly unique among Jewish men of letters. That not you know it's not so unusual to find poems that touch on warfare, that touch on death of, of various sorts. But this is a man who was leading armies into battle and and wrote of of his enemies and wrote of his battle and wrote of his warfare. So I mean, could you talk to us a little bit about Shmuel Hanagid, the the man who reflected upon warfare based on decades mm-hmm. of you know firsthand experience? Actual, yeah. actual fighting. Yeah. It also reminds me of something you said before, just in the side. Um, when you said that there, the great tra- traditional Jewish thinkers, Nachmanides, Maimonides, etc., uh, didn't come from that period where we talked about that they came from later. But Avram ibn Ezra did, right, as a biblical commentator. He's the fifth important poet. And that's just something to keep in mind that um, we do, and, and of course we have Halevi, but anyway, we'll get to that. Um, so the obvious model is, is, is David, 
Um, and Hanagid embraces that model, you know, f- frontally, uh, full face, and with real gusto. And he sees himself as a kind of latter day David. And just as um, as these poets took from took everything from or built their poetry on a biblical Hebrew, technically, so too Hanagid typologically or very consciously modeled himself after biblical figures. Um, His first collection, Diwan, is the Arabic word for collection of poetry, as it is also the word for archive uh, in Arabic, um, is called Benti Hilim literally son of psalms or after psalms. He sees himself in the psalmic tradition, which is to say a lyrical poet who is also engaged in some kind of national martial enterprise, which is complicated by the fact that the army he's leading is not Jewish. It's not even it's not Israelite. The army is Muslim. The victories are for the Berber king of Granada. And yet he writes about them in Hebrew and sees them all in typological biblical fashion. He renames the enemies of the Granadan city-state in Andalusia. He gives them biblical names. They're the Canaanites, they're this. He's completely seeing all this in parallel terms, but also real terms. It's both concrete and abstract and allegorical at once. Um, so the, the first book is called Benti Hilim, he's, and he uh, declares in one of the poems, in one of the martial poems, um, when he's getting some flack, it would seem, in the context of the poem from sp- members of the Jewish community, you know, why are you fighting the, fight, the battles of the Goyim, basically? And, and he, they're objecting to what he's doing, and he said, um, you know, I am the David of my age. And it becomes, it's, a, it's a line that rhymes the, you know, when he says, the David of my age gets all the emphasis. And, and he's channeling all that. And he's doing it not as the weak poet who's crushed by that burden of the past, but as someone who actually can channel that entire biblical and without quoting Midrashic and uh, tradition and do it in such a way that makes it all come alive and be relevant for the people of his time. Um, his second two books, he has, we think he has three books, are um, Ben Mishle and Ben Kohelet. So he sees himself in the Solomonic epigrammatic tradition there, the wisdom tradition, where he's taking proverbs um, may, from that, you know, wisdom is universal. Wisdom is not particular, it's not Jewish per se. So he's taking proverbs from Arabic, which may come from Persian, which may come from Indian languages, and maybe he's making some of them up himself. And it's all the, the, the border, the line between sort of what's new and what's old is, is very sort of um, malleable there. Um, and so he sees himself in the tradition, in, in, in a line of, Jewish, of great Jewish leaders, and he's up to it. It's fascinating. If you don't mind, I'd actually like to read out a um, a few lines from one of the poems that you translated of his, which appears in your introduction to the uh, book of Shmuel Hanagid, uh, because that's uh, um, page uh, page eight of the introduction, um, uh, w- w- which is Shmuel Hanagid sort of talking about himself um, and and ascribing his own role. And it's fascinating to me because this seems to be, um, let's say, unusual for a, a Jewish person of letters, and I'll. Uh, I'll elaborate in a moment. So, so they ask him, who are you and what is this? And so Shmuel Hanagid responds, I can read it in your English translation. I am the heir of Kahat, the remnant of Merari, men of renown and excellent craft. And from my father too, Samuel, Elkanah's son, the bloodlines cross. Likewise with Moses, the prophet of God, who is kin to me. When the people are gathered, I'll call him my father. And he'll call me my son when the people are gathered. And they who question my lineage will find their own much flawed. I have glory and wealth, though God alone knows strength and power. My songs surpass even those of the Levites, 
even those of the close cropped priests. Um, which, I mean, it, it's magnificent poetry, and I'm sure in the Hebrew is um, stitching together all kinds of uh, biblical imagery, uh, but also sh- displaces immense, well, I would say self-confidence and, and self-assertion, that he stands in this line, and he is a legitimate uh, expresser of, of, of this line, of this glorious um, you know, line of, of poetry and, and of service of God. Um, was this faithful to, to Shmuel HaNagid? Was this characteristic of who he was? Okay, so you know, you, you I wouldn't say you stepped on a landmine, I but see. <laughs> this, this is a complicated one. Uh, on at face value, yes, this is I am the heir of Kahat the Ram. He's, he's embracing this lineage with about as much gusto as possible. But we have to ask what's the context of the poem first? And this is a poem where, um, let me see, we're in the book just so I can give you a a sense of how it starts. Um, he basically is throwing a big party at his palace. Right? He's the, he's also probably the wealthiest Jew there, or one of the wealthy. And it's a palace that his, his son, they say, built a built a palace that may be the the foundations of the Alhambra. Anyway, he um, he uh, invites here. It's I call the poem "How I Help the Wise." And it starts the all these poems have captions in, in Judeo Arabic by Hanagid's sons. He paid his children to copy out the poems from a very young when they were very young, part of their education, and he obviously dictated things. So the, the caption here reads, and he recited a poem in which he boasts and offers an excellent description of wine. Right? This is a this is a poem about wine. But I was just saying, of course, very significant because Technically, wine is outlawed under Islamic law, but um, but, but as far as I know, during those uh, during that particular period in in Islamic Spain, the rules were somewhat lax. So we say. So that's you know that's another huge thing. I mean, Arabic poetry, not just in Islam. It's true that I, I think of uh, Islamic Spain as the California of both the Jewish and the uh, and the Islamic world. Far from Baghdad, far from the centers of power, they get away with you know they they were more lax, but. Islamic poetry, Islamic. Arabic poetry written in an Islamic context in Baghdad in the 8th century and the 9th century is full of wine and full of pederasty and full of all kinds of things that are forbidden, that are outlawed. You know, the history, the diwan of the, the archive of the Arabs is poetry, and it's full of wine. So you can, again, allegorize it away, or you can say, okay, you know, it was forbidden, but they did it. A lot of... Like yes, a lot of things, exactly. it wasn't like it wasn't the end of the world. The culture did which speaks well to the kind of more, as you say, the Californian, you know, putting that to one side, but the more relaxed and more um, inclusive, tolerant atmosphere that pervaded that allowed Jews to, to get ahead and to assume such. Yeah, we can we can call it inclusive. We can call it tolerant, relaxed. We could also call it a an ability to hold contradictory cultural mores and ideas in right. mind to extend the notion of either how we interpret those laws or that we can do this and we can do that. And we can, it's hard, but we can hold them in tension. And that tension will create power, a kind of nuclear cultural power. Um, so the first thing, let's just look at that, uh, that caption. He recited a poem in which he boasts and offers an excellent description of wine. So you've gone down to the wine, rightfully. Um, but the boast is also interesting because boasting is is one of the four central sort of things that an Arabic poet traditionally has to be able to do. This goes back to pre-Islamic Arabic poetry. Description is one. I don't remember what the others are, but boasting is one of the four. And and it's a complicated thing, boasting. I mean, we don't like it. It's not in our culture that's like, you know, that's not a good thing to boast. But where in our culture do we find boasting that is appropriate or understandable what would you say anywhere uh, well w- w- when one any? applies for a job and uh you know basically has to construct a cv that without I mean, that's uh, that's just okay, lying you're right, you're right. <laughs> yeah. generally that's flat out lying um i, I would yeah. say funnily enough my mind actually jumped to rap music wait exactly exactly yeah i mean 
Nobody says I'm not. Well, some people do. Maybe I do it sometimes too. But um, rap, that's part of the game, right? Can, who can outdo the other person? The other place I think we see it is in sports. Yes. Right? There's a way in which the athlete used to see it with, the, with rugby, World Cup rugby, right? The New Zealanders. And, uh, but you certainly see it in basketball, American basketball and football. And there's, there's a certain space for it. And even someone like Norman Mailer advertisements for myself, there's a, there's a certain level of kind of cultural personal confidence. It's like sort of like the cocaine of, uh, of cultural expression. And so it comes out of a really noble, long tradition of Arabic verse of what is going on in that boast? What kind of cultural, I always think of, try to step out of my own 20th, 21st century perspective for a second here. This is, after all, 11th century poetry, even though we're reading it now. And that, that's another tension that's important. But what is the cultural value that's being worked out? What is the value that's being worked out in something that's strange to us, boasting? And in this case, if we look at Arabic poetry, we see both there's a kind of cultural group tribal consolidation that's being worked out, like in the wake of martial victory. I am, what, what are you out there doing with the Goyim on the battlefield? I am the David of my age. And then he gives you his lineage and it goes back to this. And this is what I'm doing. You idiot. I'm, I am extending the culture. Unlike you who's staying home and minding your own business. Right? So that's in that one. This one's more complicated because it's a party. He's throwing a party. He gets all the nobles, the Jewish nobles, aristocrats, writers, philosophers, intellectuals, he, he's got a lavish food spreads, the furniture. He describes the palace. It's, it's just the height of luxury and pleasure and, and release, abandoned, Dionysiac kind of you know, uh, release. And he basically gets them all, he says, he describes them. They're basically, they can't stand up. And they're all drunk. And when they're, when they're drunk and then, then they finally get up, he says, you know, what you read. I am the heir of Kahat, the remnant of Merari, men of renown and excellent craft, and from my father to Samuel Elk and the son, the bloodlines cross. And he, li- he gives it to him. Now, either this guy is just a pompous jerk, right. or there's something much more complicated going on. And I remember when I was working on this poem, talking to the medieval scholar friends of mine in Jerusalem, it's weird. It's really hard to explain exactly. When the Marshall boasts, we understand. That's, a, that's more, more straightforward. When Ibn Gabi Roll, and on his poem, he boasts even more than Hanagid. When, when he talks about wisdom, and without this wisdom, you will die. You will die like a bad poem, right? he says. Um, this one's weirder. And one way, of, one way of reading it is just to say, it's weird and enjoy it because it's totally entertaining. Yes. Another way, which uh, one scholar uh, who's escaping, the name is escaping right now, he wrote three volume, uh, I can't remember, um, basically says there's a tradition of sort of hyperbolic lineage, declaration of hyperbolic lineage in Arabic, which is just that. It's kind of hyperbolic self-satire. It's part of the party. You know, there's almost like a Purim dimension to this. Yes, there's a, it's almost becomes a kind of group boast of this is, yes, this is a Jewish renaissance. This, we are able to do all these things here. I mean, that's a, a gross reduction, crass reduction of it. But, but this, is a, this one is a really complicated one. That's why I said you stepped on a landmine there. But it made a nice picture when it exploded. A hundred percent. And, uh, yeah. wow. It, it, this stuff is fascinating. And this brings up maybe one final question on, on Hannah Gid specifically, which is exactly this tension because, you know, as you say, he is at this drinking party and he is, he, I presume he spends a lot of his time with other courtiers and other viziers who are all part of the Islamic uh, culture. What, what, if any, are the very recognizably Jewish facets of his poetry, of his writings? Because at the end of the day, I mean, aside from the fact it is in Hebrew, yes, and it is, it contains a lot of the Hebrew Bible as such. Um, but more emotionally, on terms of sensibility or feeling or description, um, you know, a lot of it is coming from from his Islamic context. But is there 
some core, I'm not phrasing this question so well, but some core Jewishness or, or Jewish um, sensibility or look, way of looking at the world that shines through. Hmm. Well, you're the historian. I, I apologize. I mean, can, <laughs> can, we, can we ask that, or what happens when we ask that of any period in Jewish history? Is there some kind of essence? I mean, yes, I think there actually, we can risk hazard some, some answers. Usually we get slapped down right away when we do that. Um, and they immediately become, we look for examples in other non-Jewish sense. Well, it's not actually not Jewish, right? Everything that's Jewish seems to come from somewhere else anyway, but it's put together in an interesting way that may be specifically Jewish. Um, first of all, the Jewish, what I call mythopoetic dimension, which is to say the, the Jewish, the textual Jewish legacy it's huge. I mean, you just, it's not just that it's biblical Hebrew, it's that, that channeling all that stuff is, is, is a major part. Although, and this is also important to keep in mind, this I also learned from one of the scholar colleagues in, in Jerusalem. Um, even if you don't know anything about the Bible, and, and students today, or at least 20 years ago in Jerusalem, fewer and fewer students know the Bible, right? It's not Something even in Israel that's required reading in high so. school curriculum. Yes. Yeah. Um, and certainly my students at Yale, wonderful as they are, and they are quite amazing and reading this poetry is, you know, tremendous joy with them. Um, I mean, it's a tremendous joy for me to read this poetry with them. Um, but they don't know the Bible. So, yeah, I always get a couple of yeshiva bookers, the ringers, but they know the Bible in a different direction. <laughs> uh, the point is that even if you don't know the Bible, this poetry can be really, really powerful. And then when the sort of biblical dimension is teased out, it becomes even more surprising, remarkable. But you don't, that's not, it, it's amazing without it. Um, I guess if we want to ask that sort of essential Jewish question, what? As soon as we get to Ibn Gabi Roll, we're going to have a completely different answer. And they're so we'll get to him in a moment. That. So this is, I suppose, the, yeah, the, the yeah. bridge between the two. Right. But um, for me, the combination of total groundedness in social, material, concreteness and particularity, at the heart of which is some other, I'm going to put it in quotes and say sort of some transcendent principle um, is carried out in a certain way, such a way that seems to me I recognize it as, as deeply Jewish. I respond to it as deeply Jewish. Maybe for a kind of proof text, I will turn to Yehuda Amichai, right, the great Israeli poet who always held Hanagid up as his favorite poet. He, he wrote his college exams about Hanagid, and, content, and one of the things he said he loved about Hanagid was the way he would, Hanagid moves from the particular to the general. And that, that yoking, you know, again, it's like you're back to picking up mercury here. Why is that Jewish? How is that Jewish? What do you mean that's not Hindu? Or I, but but you but Jews know what they, what what I mean when I say that I think. In which case, the, let's use this as a bridge to get onto the, the second character we wanted to discuss, though we don't have so much time to discuss him, which is uh, Solomon Ibn Gabirol, who was essentially a younger contemporary of uh, of Shmuel Hanakid. They corresponded, they wrote to each other. In fact, uh, Gabirol was spent some time in Hanakid's sort of apprenticeship, I suppose. Um, except he had a far less successful uh, and less happy life. So it seems. I mean, he he seems to have wandered a lot and and not particularly succeeded in his endeavors too much. Um, but y you mentioned that when asking about the Jewishness or Jewish output of Gabirol, the answer would be c completely different and you seem to imply more certain or something you could put your finger on better. So, you know. Yeah. Um, they, they're just op total polar opposites. Mm -hmm. If Hanagid is the ultimate kind of worldly figure and worldly wise figure, who lived this astonishing public life um, and was integrated into every society that he was a part of at 
in, in really every way. Uh, and obviously, and is written about in Arabic historical chronicles as an extraordinary person. I mean, even people who didn't like him admitted he was an extraordinary man. His son was not, and that's why they hated him, who inherited his position, and, and basically uh, killed him as, as part of a massacre of the Grenadian Jewry. Um, Ibn Gabi Roll was born... 27 years later, we, we don't know exactly. I mean, Hanagi, we know his birth date and we know his, we know the, and his death date. We know the precise minute of his children's birth. We know where Hanagi was at every battle because he's got it written down in these poems. Ibn Gabiro, we don't even know what year he was born. We got three different death dates for him. We don't really know where he lived. We know he was he spent time in, in Saragossa and in Malaga. Maybe he crossed paths with Hanagid in Granada. It seems like he did. It seems like they had a fight, but we don't have any proof of any of this. He just he's invisible. And um, as extroverted as Hanagid was, Ibn Gabirol was a total introvert, a total inward, philosophical, speculative creature, a misanthrope. It's clear. He did not get along with people. He made enemies very quickly, probably was itinerant, and that's probably one of the reasons we don't have uh, records about him, that he moved from Jewish community to Jewish community, maybe as a kind of chazan or maybe as a kind of writing pew team for different communities. Um, so in every way, and he was essentially a kind of metaphysical poet. Um, so, so the opposite in that way. and. A Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, very explicit in his Neoplatonism, a kind of the Kabbalists look back to him as a kind of proto Kabbalist, as a model of mystical speculation. Um, all these things are very different from Hanagid, but also represent a kind of classic part of, of um, that Jewish, whatever it is that we uh, keep trying to not talk about, like the name of God. Um, but an example is one of his great master, poetic masterpieces, Ketra Malchud, I translate as Kingdom's Crown, is recited as part of the Yom Kippur liturgy. Right? So not, not that a lot of communities recite it anymore or read it silently, um, but he didn't write it for the synagogue. That one he actually didn't write for the synagogue. He wrote it as a kind of didactic medita religious meditation and then it was brought into the synagogue. Um, so even like the greatest poem of his is said silently on Yom Kippur. Um, so yeah, he's just, he's just the, the, the total opposite. But he's, he's like the, he's the total, the, the ultimate sort of transcendent um, sensibility, although irascible, uh, as provocative as they come. He didn't have children. He didn't marry. He didn't have children. He writes poems about giving people advice not to have children. I mean, really? That's not exactly Jewish. That's, yeah. Wow, I had no idea. That's fascinating. Um, there's, yeah. there's one aspect you mentioned there which, which I'd like to perhaps slightly elaborate on, which is um, the fact that, that Ibn Gabriel appeared to be one thing that Shmuel Halagib wasn't, which was a philosopher, or rather someone who wrote, who also wrote actual right. philosophy. There's a lot of philosophical Aspect in Halak's like poetry, but he never, we don't have any sort of philosophical treatise. Mm -hmm. Whereas Gabriel did and was actually respected. If, if you sort of read histories of Jewish philosophy, you will find uh, Ibn Gabriel. Um, he's, he's, major, a, yeah. Yeah, he's a serious figure, a, a Neoplatonic philosophy. So, I mean, so, so obviously, as you mentioned, his philosophy does come into his poetry. They're not uh, hermetically sealed off one from another. Um, so, so, yeah, I suppose the question would be in what sense does he do this and what sense does he accomplish this? Meaning, is, to what degree does he use his poetry as a sort of pedagogical medium, a way to teach people or to spread his philosophy or to explain his philosophy, perhaps in ways that you can't do in prose writing? Uh, how adept was he at that? Yeah, I mean, the philosophy is, the poetry is saturated with the philosophy, um, which isn't, uh, technically the type of poetry we're to, you know, you, you're pointing to here is sort of, didactic poetry and and that makes it sound terrible and right. boring and heavy and all that and it's not i mean the poetry in which there's a kind of embodied teaching and learning 
it is so sublime. You know, I love you for the love a man has for his only son with his heart and his soul and his mind. And I, uh, and, uh, with his heart and his soul and his might. And I take great pleasure in your minds. It takes the mystery on of the Lord's act in creation. And the issue is distant and deep. And who could approach its foundation? But I'll tell you something I heard. And he goes on. It's got the Shema. It's got sort of mystical Neoplatonic philosophy in it. The thing he's going to tell the student. Um, it's all there, but it's 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 in this kind of crystal crystallized form. You know, when you see a crystal under a microscope or just as a crystal, first you just say, wow. You're just going to remember the crystal. Yeah, how it's structured, you can learn things about that and how to do other things with those structures. But there's a kind of tremendous, there is something miraculous about his poetry in that way. When he looks at, a, at a, he's at writing a poem about a garden and he sees a bead of dew on the, on the grapevine and it's frozen and, and then it thaws in the spring and then it trickles into the grapevine stem and then it produces a grape and then the grape is made into wine and somebody, maybe him, drinks it and maybe he gets a little high and he walks in the garden and he sees how beautiful the garden is and he sees the light changing over it and the light from on high and then he looks at the sun and he sees the connection to the greater order above. That's what he does. That's also an embodiment of his philosophy, and it's not didactic. No, that, <laughs> it's totally it's lyrical. It's not. A, it's not a thirty um, days has September, etc. Kind of poem. It's right. A, yeah, and he does that all over the place. I mean, I think he's just an amazing, amazing, great poet. He just blows my mind, um, in a very different way than Hanagi does. Um, but also, but so with the philosophy that he's known as. He wrote a book called The Fountain of Life, Makor Chaim in Hebrew, but he wrote it in Arabic. And uh, it was lost for many years, centuries. And when it was, when the manuscript itself was rediscovered, I think also the 19th century, it was assumed that the author was Christian or Muslim. Yes. Because there were no Jewish references in it. Um, uh, but Keter Mahut, Kingdom's Crown, his great poetic masterpiece, is essentially the same philosophy in verse. It's not that he took the philosophy and said, I'm going to write a poem about it. No. We don't, first of all, we don't know which came first. But the point is that was just him. Sometimes it came out as philosophy. Sometimes it came out as poetry. Yehuda Amichai has a great, uh, also, Ibn Gabi Roll poem called Ibn Gabi Roll. And uh, it starts out, in, uh, as I translate it, something like, sometimes pus, sometimes a poem, always something excreted. Right, and it was Ibn Gabriel. Sometimes what you got was just pus, just the putts, <laughs> and sometimes you got sublimity. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes you got that's very interesting. And, and just what you were saying before, it's possible that that might be at least the beginning of an answer to a question about the Jewish essence. Because um, I had a conversation on this podcast a couple of months ago with Miriam Goldstein, uh, a great scholar of the uh, again medieval Islamic period. Um, and one thing she pointed out, and I thought this was very significant, was the fact that of all Jewish literary output, specifically poetry was in Hebrew. Was everything else tended to be science Absolutely. or philosophy or whatever else, or literature, whatever else it was, tended to be in Arabic. Whereas there's something poetic that has to be in Hebrew. Well, what else is in? What else is in? There's only one other thing that's in Hebrew. You're, you're right. In prayer, Hebrew, I suppose. Right. Prayer. Yes. Yeah. So these are the two privileged forms of expression. That itself tells you a yes. lot. The British wrong expression about the status of and, and perhaps, as you mentioned, in matters of of sublimity and matters that perhaps cannot be expressed, let's say in in concrete terms or, or in terms that are too concrete, that require some kind of sublime literary expression, that has to be in Hebrew because the, the lingua franca of the day won't won't contain it, and and maybe that's a point towards uh, Jewishness. Well, look, these poets could have written in poetry in Arabic, and some of them did. Uh, Al Harizi, who comes a little later, we have pretty sublime. Mm -hmm. Arabic poems by right. him, um, and a lot of that had to do with again cultural vision, cultural context. Um, I should add one thing. Just um, we're talking about these kind of Hanagid and Ibn Gabirol, and I know we don't have time for it, but obviously there are other, still other essential Jewish ways of being in this period, which we we'll get to is someone like Halevi, right. who is actually the most famous mm -hmm. poet. In some ways, but for different reasons. Right. Yeah. But yeah but I, one of the reasons we haven't touched on Halevi or Ibn Ezra is because I think they deserve entire episodes to themselves um, and, and, you know, require very deep 
uh, analysis because they are of they are uh, magnificent. I suppose I, I want to ask one last question to to, to end off um, a little bit, which is you know, so, so in your own work, you in your books and in your your classes, you attempt to bring medieval poetry into the modern period. You have to translate across time and also across culture and and across sort of I would say intellectual boundaries or intellectual paradigms between the medieval period and nowadays. Um, and you know. So, so how do you do this? I mean, what are the what are the techniques you have, or, or, or you know, what, what are the what are the I suppose the principal challenges and joys of doing this? But also, is even the most brilliant translation truly successful? Mm -hmm. So the parallel between teaching and translation is kind of interesting, and it's interesting to me. But let's just start with the simple question. Um, I think the challenges of translating this poetry are the challenges of translating all poetry. Think of it in terms of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. Right. Like, start with that. <laughs> in other words, don't, don't take a good poem and make it a bad First, poem. First, do no harm. Try yes. not. Right. Yeah, do know the Hippocratic Oath of the Translator. Right. Uh, um, and that's Dante Gabriel Rossetti has that. Don't make a good poem a bad poem. That's the, that's the first thing. And um, at least do your best not to do that. Uh, you know, and yet we're also in slippery territory here because you ask any translator and you're just going to get all roads lead to why their translation is the greatest translation. Uh, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to try to give you some principles. Um, um, George Steiner said that literary translation is not an exact science. It's an exact art. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful. Just, there was, yes, there there. It's not just pure subjectivity. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this, but it is an art and it has that kind of degree of elusiveness. Um, when I, I teach translation also, and I love to teach translation, and, and I think you can teach translation as a kind of, almost as a kind of central human value almost. Um, and one of the things I start with and this goes to, to teaching also, generally, in reading, is when you read a poem as a poem, not as a container of information, right, but as a, a, as a unity of style, uh, of content and form, as a, as a verbal thing that comes into your mouth and your brain and your heart and, and sometimes really hurts you or sometimes just makes you smile or you remember it rest of your life or carry it around in your wallet or you forget about it and 20 years later you remember. In each case, for every person, that's going to be different in that experience. Right. And um, Schleiermacher, the great German theologian and scholar of translation and translator of Greek uh, works, he said, what is it that has, you, what you need to translate is the experience of being pierced by the beauty of the original. And I'm going to take beauty here in the widest sense that it includes ugliness or the way ugliness meets your experience of beauty or profundity or of sorrow or of all kinds of things. Right? So I ask students and I ask myself, what have you been pierced by? And how can you go about accounting for that in English? Let's start with that and see what you produce. And then... Look at what else you didn't account for, let's say, what else is in the Hebrew that maybe you can get smuggled back in. But if you start with what you think is in the Hebrew, academically or in terms of knowledge or history, and then build a poem, you're going to get a wax museum figure. You're going to get a perfect model of the perfect horse that can't run. But, it, but that experience of being pierced that's what the poem is. And pierced with all of the, as an ornament, as something that hurts, as something that could kill, as Ibn Gabriel said. So that's what I'm after. And so it's trying to then take apart, as Pope did with Homer, you, you sort of atomize, you deconstruct your experience that shouldn't be deconstructed, but you're going to deconstruct it because you want to do something different with it. As Jose Saramago, the Portuguese novelist, said, translation is about uh, changing something so that it can go on being the same. 
So if we embrace, in other words, something has to become different in order to go on being itself, which is a, a really profound thing. And, to, and you have to live with it. So embracing, accepting, but not becoming any less rigorous about the difference that's involved in translation, not only the sameness is a really, really important thing. And so I try to get people to be very specific, get myself to be, train myself to be very specific about what that experience is of being pierced, and also to make sure that you've read, that you've informed yourself. Like in, the information comes from form, the form that came from Arabic and the form that came from Hebrew also. And the, you know, so it's, that information is not just knowledge, it's structure and it's aesthetics. And to, to learn a, a vocabulary that's going to extend you a little bit, and take you out of yourself and make yourself a little different so that you can go on talking about this poetry as really great and interesting poetry. And not just as, well, the Jews did something really interesting in the golden age a long time ago. And, you know, you kind of have to just study a lot to figure out what's great about it. I don't think that's the way poetry works in Hebrew or in Chinese or in any other language. Okay, there's, there's so much more here, but uh, we're going to have to call it a day. Uh, we run quite significantly over time. But, um, you know, all of, these, all of these topics that we've broached could be discussed quite significantly. I've got quite a... You know, significantly greater amount of time, and um, but we don't have time for that today. Mr. Cole, thank you so very, very much for joining us on the podcast Jewish Ideas. This has been nothing less than a pleasure. Thank you, JJ. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kim, edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org/slash donate.